Hello friends, welcome to video series on geography. In this video, I'll be explaining about tectonics. And the first important concept under tectonics is continental drift theory. And the text files for this video can be found in poormanfriend.org. Previously, I explained about Earth's interior. This is where the core concepts of geography began. And this is the beginning of geomorphology as well. And then I've explained about earth movements. We have seen about continent forming or epirogenic movements and then oro orogenic movements. And now we'll begin with tectonics. Tectonics is simply large scale movement of earth's crust, usually or what we consider, consider as lithosphere. And based on the changes or movements, large scale movements of this earth's crust, we have different theories which have changed from time to time. For example, continental drift theory is the oldest one, which was explained by Alfred Wegener in 1920s. And then there is an important concept called seafloor spreading. It came into existence after World War II. And then we have plate tectonics. This was ex explained in 1960s. So with passage of time, theories got better and the plate tectonics is the most accepted theory, whereas the theory of continental drift is completely discarded. But still, this theory is important for exam as it forms the basis for seafloor spreading and plate tectonics. Even seafloor spreading is an important theory which explains the movement of oceanic plates. So we'll study all these in detail. So in the next video, we'll cover tectonics and orogeny. Coming to important theories related to tectonics, the first one is continental drift theory. Then we have something called as convectional current theory and then seafloor spreading theory, plate tectonics, and then polar wandering. So polar wandering is nothing different from continental drift theory, whereas other theories like convection current theory forms the heart of seafloor spreading and plate tectonics. So this is the basic theory behind seafloor spreading and plate tectonics. Seafloor spreading explains spreading of seafloor and the movement of oceanic plates. It doesn't consider the movement of continental plates. Whereas plate tectonics consider earth to be divided into various lithospheric plates and the movement between these plates is explained by plate tectonics. And this is convectional current theory, we'll study this in detail. So what is polar wandering? As I've said, polar wandering is nothing different from continental drift theory. This theory, the polar wandering theory explains that the pole has shifted, the poles have shifted their location from time to time. And this shift is only apparent. It simply means that we know that this is Earth and Earth is as an axis which is tilted by an angle of 23 and a half degree. And Earth rotates along this axis and this is North Pole and the other one is South Pole. So we have different continents. For example, we have North America, South America on the western side and then parts of Europe on the east. During continental drift, usually the, the position of continents was totally different. So there was continuous change of position of continents. As a result, it is apparent that the position of poles have also shifted when we consider relative to the position of continents. So this is not of prime importance as we'll see in detail more about this shifting in continental drift theory. So before we study continental drift theory, we need to have an understanding about geologic time scale because in continental drift theory, we, we arrive at terms like Mesozoic era, Jurassic period, then Cretaceous period, etc. So we need to have a brief understanding of, of, of geologic time scale. Since the birth of Earth, the time timeline of the whole process that took place on Earth are divided into various super eons. Till now, there are only two super eons. The present one is the second. And then each super eon, which is of billion, billions of years in length, is divided into eons, which are of few hundred million years in length, and then into eras, periods, epoch, and age. So this order is important. Once in prelims, this order was asked as a multiple choice question. So let's see what happened after the birth of Earth. We know that Earth was born about 4.5 billion years ago due to what the theory explained by as nebula theory of Laplace. We have seen that in previous videos. So about 4.5 billion years ago, the Precambrian Supion began. It lasted for about 4 billion years. It consisted of few important eons like Hayden, Archin and Proterozoic eon. 
So these two super ions are mainly associated with formation of landforms on Earth, like the uh, volcanoes and then volcanic eruptions leading to huge amount of magma on the Earth's surface and the cooling of magma gave rise to different types of rocks etc. So all this process took place during these two eons. And then Proterozoic Eon is very important because during this eon, the simple microscopic organisms came into existence. So after 4 billion years, the end of, it, it was the end of Precambrian era. At this time, the only life form was multi, uh, single cellular organisms, especially in oceans. And then with the ending of Precambrian Super Eon, we have Panerozoic Eon. So the Super Eon is not named. We just directly move to Panerozoic Eon. So this eon is mainly associated with formation of non-vertebrates and multicellular organisms simple in simple forms. And then in Panerozoic eon we have Paleozoic era. So from here we have very important events taking place. For example, there was ex uh, birth of or existence of non-vertebrates. And non-vertebrates gave rise to vertebrates in the form of mainly fishes in the oceans. And then fishes which were moving to the earth and going back to the water got converted into amphibians and these are all vertebrates and then amphibians became reptiles and reptiles moved further above the evolutionary process and became birds and birds later gave rise to mammals means this is just advancement of evolution or one life form advancing into the next stage. So finally we have mammals on earth. So the order I have told is not exact but still this is just the order in which one could take into consideration the evolution of various organisms. Usually we start with non-vertebrates and from non-vertebrates we have vertebrates. In vertebrates the first one are fishes. From fishes we have amphibians and from amphi amphibians we have what we see as reptiles and then birds and then mammals. So all these evolutionary process took place between uh, during this Paleozoic era and these are different periods. And of this, the Carboniferous period is the most important because the formation of coal in various parts of the uh, world like <coughs> the Great Lakes region and the parts of Ukraine and Russia uh, have all been formed during this carb Carboniferous period. And the coal that is obtained, that is formed, that the formation which has begun during Carboniferous period is of very high quality. It is called as anthracite coal. Usually this kind of coal is absent in India because the formation of coal took place much later of this period. So Indian coal is not as old as Carboniferous uh, coal. As a result, it, it doesn't have sufficient amount of carbon. So it doesn't qualify to fall, come under anthracite. There are only few deposits of, of anthracite coal and others are like bituminous coal which are less less uh, which contain less amount of carbon and are less quality and then for the continental drift theory this is where the important aspects begin with the permian period during this period the continental drift haven't yet began but after this period the exact uh, the important one is mesozoic era and the continental continents started drifting during this period so one has to remember these eras or uh, the terms that come with continental drift theory and then we have Triassic and Jurassic period which was proliferation of dinosaurs and other uh, bigger reptiles and then Cretaceous gave rise to the extinction of dinosaurs usually earth has seen five to six, six mass extinction events and the wipeout of dinosaurs is one such extinction event and then we have Cenozoic era the recent times about 70 million years ago on this time is important this uh, time period is important because it gave rise to the formation of Deccan traps and then in tri Triassic period that is somewhere between this Paleogene period and Neogene period there was formation of Himalayas and now we are in the modern age Halocene about 10,000 years and what we see now about a thousand to a uh, few hundreds of years back we consider this as modern era so this is a brief introduction of geologic time scale you, know, you need not remember all these names but there are few important names which keeps coming in our future videos as well as a lot of concepts in geography so just keep a track of these names let us now go to the core concepts of continental drift theory according to this theory explained by Wegener in 1922 earth had a huge continent called as Pangaea 
it was due, it was surrounded by a huge content, a huge ocean called as Panthalassa. So the name of the ocean is Panthalassa, and the name of the continent is Pangaea. And all the parts of continents were not separated, or they were all intact during the Permian period, that is about 250 million years ago. And there was a narrow sea called as Thetis between major divisions of this landform. So this is the part of Thetis which we will see distinctly in later parts. And these continents started drifting or moving away from each other due to various forces. We will study about forces later. And this drift is termed as continental drift. So the drifting began in Mesozoic era that is in the early parts of Triassic period. And the continents started separating and the Thetis had a definite shape. So this narrow sea is called Thetis. So with the drifting of continents, the northern parts are considered as Laurasia and the southern parts are called as Gondwana land. So we can see which part, which all regions fall under Laurasia and Gondwana land. For example, North America, Europe and Asia are part of Laurasia, whereas Africa, South America, India, Madagascar, Antarctica and Australia are all part of Gondwana land. So the drift started about 2 million, 200 million years ago, that is in the early Mesozoic era, which is also called as Triassic period. So now the breakup of Pangaea began and they came the existence of rifts or narrow breakages between various continents. So the rifts were not significant when it comes to Antarctica as Australia is still at attached to Antarctica during the initial parts. But India has already started breaking up around 200 million years ago. You can see Madagascar also got separated from Africa. And the major continents like South America and North America are moving westwards, whereas the continents like Africa, <coughs> India and then Australia are moving northwards. So Eurasia is also has drifted few uh, thousand kilo kilometers northwards and the major, fo major forces for this kind of drift are explained as the first one is rotation of earth. Rotation of earth gave rise to a force called pole fleeing force where continents tend to move away from poles. We have we know that rotation creates centripetal force where the parts are thrown away from the center uh, tends to be moving away from the center and this force of centripetal uh, force is important in explaining the movement of continents away from poles. Usually all the Gondwana land, major parts of the Gondwana land were near South Pole. So all these parts started sh sh drifting except Antarctica. And then other important force is buoyancy. Buoyancy is nothing but the force that keeps ships floating on water. It is called as buoyant force. So buoyant, buoyancy of water that is the force supplied by oceans is another major reason as explained by Wegener for drifting of continents. Other than, the, other than these, there is important force called tidal force. Usually when earth is rotating from west to east, there is a force acting in opposite direction. This is called tidal force. That is the force uh, which is mainly expressed by water surface or the whole ocean part. And this force has shifted the oceans westwards. For example, North America and South America shifted westwards. So these are the different forces as suggested by Wegener. In the later part, about during, during the Jurassic period, that is about 145 million years ago, we can see the movement is very quick. India is moving very fast towards the equator. Madagascar is still close to Africa. And then we can see the clear divisions between South America and Africa and then North America and Asia. So the rift has already formed between Australia and Antarctica. So now Australia started drifting eastwards. In contrary, contrary to what Wegener said, that is, the movement should be should have been westwards due to centripetal force as well as other forces. But still, in contrast, Australia as a whole is moving eastwards, as well as India is moving northwards towards the equator. And about 150 years after the starting of breakup of Pangaea, we see we have entered into Cretaceous period, which lasted for about 100 million years and during the end of Cretaceous period, that is about 70 million years ago, this is the position of continents. So India has already touched equator. At this time, the outpouring of Deccan traps or the formation of Deccan traps took place. There is huge volcanism, fissure type volcanism happening in the peninsula region. And this gave rise to a huge landmass called Deccan traps, which is about 15 lakh square kilometers in area. 
so presently it is only about 5 lakh kilometers but when it when it was formed it was about 15 lakh square kilometers in area and then we can see australia is drifting quickly towards east and then south america has already drifted far away from africa and this drift has continued and was very quick in the last 70 years we can see there was greater in the present day we see there is greater difference or extension between these lands and australia and india have moved very quickly towards east and north we can see india got collided with the eurasian plate which gave rise to the formation of himalayas and this event took place about 40 million years ago this is called triassic a triassic period so all these timelines are important in explaining continental drift theory so let, j just let us take a look at brief look at timelines we have seen about each of these eras and their importance and we'll see mainly with concerns about continental drift theory we can see in permian period the pangaea was intact that is it was a total whole single land mass and then in triassic period or early mesozoic era we have seen the breakup of pangaea which began and then in jurassic period all continents got separated from europe and asia except europe and asia we see that europe and asia are not separated except that all continents generated drifts with the uh, neighboring continents and then in Cretaceous period, that is early parts of Cretaceous period, the drift was quick and in the later parts we see the formation of the continents moving further apart except Eurasia and India reaches equator. This is important event. This took this happened about 70 million years ago. And this coincides with the formation of Deccan traps. This is between late Cretaceous and early Cenozoic era. And then in tertiary period, that is about 40 to 50 million years ago, India collides with Asia and this gives rise to Himalayas. So this is what continental drift theory is all about. Now let us look at evidences and their criticism. So the major evidences which are suggested by Wegener in support of continental drift theory are apparent affinity, affinity of physical features. So there are something what are apparent that is what we can see with our eyes which looks to be promising evidences. We'll see their drawbacks as well. And then we'll have different botanical and fossil evidences and then placer deposits. Placer deposits are nothing but gold deposits. And then tillite deposits, the sedimentary deposits in the Gondwana land, that is uh, in the southern half of Pangaea, we see something called as tillite deposits. They are sedimentary deposits left, of, uh, left after glaciation period. And then we see polar wandering, which is nothing but what we have seen in the earlier theory. And then there are something like rocks of same ages or mountains of same nature which are found across different continents. We'll see them in detail. The first one is apparent affinity of physical features. So few evidences as shown by Wegener are the apparent affinity between this bulge of Brazil and the inward curve of Austria, uh, Africa shows that these two landforms were a single landmass before. So this exact fit gave Wegener an idea that these landforms were all part of single landmass. At the same time, we can see that there are different other same kind of features where we can say that the continents were attached uh, before about a few billion, a few million years ago. For example, the southern part of Australia, and then we can see Madagascar, India form a continuous stretch with Africa, and then this part of Africa nearly coincides with eastern parts of North America. So these are all apparent affinities of physical feature. That is what are what. We can see with our eyes what it is apparent and then apparent affinity of physical features with respect to mountains so there are different kind of mountains which were formed at during different times for example urals are old very old fold mountains whereas himalayas are very new or very young fold mountains so for example even appalachians are very old mountains they're of different nature again but if we see all these mountains there are two groups one is called as celadonian mountains and the other one are Hercinian mountains. So Celadonian mountains consisted of Appalachians and few mountains of northern England and then few mountains which cover Sweden and other Scandinavian countries. So all these are a part of Celadonian mountains. So some parts of Iceland, Greenland, etc. And then what we have in <coughs> northern Africa and parts of Europe and the mountains of Central Asia, all these come under Hercinian mountains. So all these mountains are a continuous chain 
uh, about 250 million years ago. This is because the Pangaea was in, intact during that time. We can see in this picture how all these mountains were a clear extinction of the same kind of mountain system. So this is one one clear example which Wegener gives. But even this thing has various drawbacks because the same kind of mountains can form or exist in different continents. So even this theory is not accepted fully. And then the major drawback is the forces which were explained, which Wegener took into consideration to explain the drifting of continents. So few forces explained were gravity, then polar fleeing force, which is uh, which is which is formed due to the rotation of Earth, and then buoyancy, which is the force offered by oceans, and then what we see as tidal force. So the major drawback is that all these forces are too minute in magnitude, and they could not influence in such a way that even they could shift the position of all continents. The, so, so the forces were very minute to have an influence on such a great land masses. So this theory is a complete fa failure when it comes to explaining the forces which led to continental drift theory. And then fossils and botanical evidence. There are important fossils like glossopteris and then we have something called as Listosaurus or something, okay, whatever it is. And then we can see a continuous chain of these fossil belts which occur around various land masses. For example, we can see the same chain of glossopteris. We can uh, observe these fossils in this belt which runs through both all these continents, South America, Africa and then Antarctica, India and Australia. So from this, Wegener also came to conclusion that this kind of existence of fossils is only because all these continents were close when they were due before the breakup of Pangaea and hence the same kind of fossils can be observed in these continuous stretches of landforms. Likewise, there are other fossils also available. Again, this theory also has some drawbacks where the same kind of fossils are available in various other parts of the world like in Iran, Afghanistan, etc. which are completely different from this Gondwana land because they are part of Laurasia. So, Wegener fails to explain or his theory later in later stages fails to explain why the, the same kind of fossils are available in other regions of the world which are greatly divided from Gondwana land. And then Tillite deposits, one more important evidence in support of continental drift theory. We can see that Africa, Antarctica and certain parts of India, Australia were all very close to South Pole. As a result, they, had this, they saw a glacial period where the landform is covered with ice sheets. So the deposits or sedimentary deposits of this Gondwana land were again found across all these regions and even this becomes a major important evidence. So it is true that there are these regions were once at the same region as explained by continental drift theory but the approach used by Wegener to explain this whole concept is totally unacceptable. So this is again one failure of Wegener's theory. So tillite deposits are present in all these regions but the problem is that Wegener took a very different approach or an approach which is scientifically disproved later stages with the study of plate tectonics. And then placer deposits. Placer deposits are nothing but gold deposits. We see gold deposits in this region that is the Ghana region. And the source rock is available in Brazil whereas the same source rock is absent in Ghana region. So usually gold is available in the form of veins in rocks. For example, we have a huge rock. Then we see a small vein in which the gold, gold, gold is filled in the form of veins. So the outer part is source rock and the inner one is the gold what we say gold mineral and then so this kind of gold mineral is available in Ghana coast whereas the entire source rock is from part of Brazil but now if you see these two parts regions are divided by miles thousands of miles so this again gives Wegener a theory to prove continental uh, in support of continental drift theory that is the absence of source rock in the Ghana region whereas the presence of source rock in the Brazil region so the major drawbacks being failed to explain why drift began in Mesozoic era and why not before. So it doesn't explain why the shift was only in Mesozoic era and, and not before and he fails to explain how the shift will end and what kind of future steps the shift will take. And then theory doesn't explain take into consideration oceans. We have seen that the continental drift theory explains only the movement of continents 
it can it considers continents and oceans to be two different entities but later plate tectonics prove that continents and oceans are a part of single mass of earth's crust which are called as lithospheric plates so wegener talks about only ocean uh, continents completely ignoring oceans this is the major drawback proofs heavily depend on assumptions as we have seen all the evidences they are all general in nature that they, they don't have proper scientific backing and then forces are a major drawback which are too weak to explain the movement of continents and then modern theory like uh, plate tectonics gave rise to the explanation of these movement of continents with a very different approach so even these modern th theories completely failed continental drift theory so this is end of what we uh, see about continental drift theory let us take a question which was asked in 2014 prelims the question is which of the following might have been influenced the evolution of organisms one is continental drift and the other one is glacial cycles so for this these kind of statements are not directly given in books we need to understand this mainly based on conceptual clarity of our understanding of the subject so continental drift we have seen the continents shifted their positions from south pole to towards the equator and so on and then glacial cycles are periods which occur due to shifting of continents for example india had a was a had a huge glacial sheet the, uh, the uh, in the initial stages of before the break up of pangaea but in later stages we see india has a subtropical climate and this shift of india from south to towards the equator can we can say that there is change in evolutionary process of animals associated with this shift because during glacial period the animals would have adapted to the cold climates whereas with the shift towards the equator the animals would get evolved to suit to the tropical climates so glacial cycles always influence evolution of organisms and then continental drift as we have seen the same explanation with drifting of continents again the continents move from one glacial region to other region as a result there will be obviously be evolution of organisms so both the answers are correct and one important question was asked in mains as well what do you understand by theory of continental drift D discuss the prominent evidences in its support sometime the question might be only about evidences we need to explain evidences in detail and then the question can be about drawbacks of continental drift theory so there there are so many ways a question can be asked from this concept so understanding having a conceptual clarity about this concept is very helpful in answering all the related questions so no matter how many time how many ways the question is shifted or twisted still you can have the same kind of answer by understanding the whole theory as a single unit so thanks for watching in next video we'll see about sea flow spreading and then we'll see about plate tectonics do subscribe to my channel thanks for watching